Well, thank you very much. I think I'm very honored to be here as a, one of the speaker of this uh, uh, fascinating, uh, I think, uh, getting together. So uh, I'd like to talk about uh, some kind of uh, story of the Stevens Johnson syndrome. Everybody knows that the difficulty of the treatment of the Stevens Johnson syndrome. But anyway, I'm from Kyoto, Japan. I'm now 11 p.m., so I'm a bit sleepy, but I'd like to do something. So uh, uh, th this is just a general question. Which ocular surface diseases exhibit limbal stem cell deficiency? The answer is all of the above, but I think I'd like to pick up the Stevens Johnson syndrome because this is uh, the, the, I would say, the devastating uh, ocular surface diseases, at least uh, in our age, I, I mean, uh, of the ophthalmologist. So when we are talking about the Stevens Johnson syndrome, not every Stevens Johnson syndrome shows the ocular complication. I would say about 20 to 30 percent have a, some kind of a ocular complication of the severe uh, as kind of complication. But we have to, uh, I would say, uh, divide it into at least three, uh, I, I think, phases, acute phase or sub-acute phase or chronic phase. Because at the chronic phase, uh, the hematological problem is almost solved because of the heating. But uh, ocular surface has a serious problem. Uh, and uh, even at the chronic phase, because in the corneal epithelial uh, uh, stem cell, they are gone. Why it's gone? Well, the question number one is uh, why are limbal stem cells severely impaired at acute phase? Aging of the ocular surface cells or pharmaceutical toxicity, dry eye, lead friction, or tear associated cytokine storm especially at acute phase. So there are still there's some of the debate, but I, I, I would say to me, here associated cytokine storm, they will, these cytokine storm will kill the uh, limbal FTL stem cells, as well as ocular uh, conjunctival stem cell. Well, this is a, just one example of the acute phase of the Stephen Johnson syndrome. We pick up the, uh, the tear samples and also the, uh, the serum, then try to measure the, all the cytokines and chemokines, about 30 of them. Among them, IL-8, IL-6, MCP-1. These three are the key cytokine and chemokine, and they are upregulated. Up but, but this is the far, I would say, over the 1,000 times more, something like that, especially in tears. Of course, serum as well. But so, so therefore, these cytokine storms, especially IL-8, IL-6, and MCP-1, they are killing the uh, corneal epithelial stem cells. So we have to do something to, to, to manage the cytokine storm. So, so therefore, many years ago, we performed the prospective study uh, using the steroid pulse therapy with a topical beta methadone. Just five cases of the 10 eyes, but these are acute phase of the Steven Johnson syndrome. So uh, these uh, treatments are very successful. We are so amazed at that time because the palisade of Bogut was maintained in all 10 eyes. Well, I would say implying that uh, FTL stem cells, at least some of the FTL stem cells are survived. And also the best corrected visual acuity was 2020 in all 10 eyes. Of course, they do not have an, any uh, viral uh, infection at that time or so. And then how much dose of the cordial steroid we use? That is, uh, we use the methyl prednisolone, either the 500 or the 1,000 milligrams per day for three days, followed by the like a 40 to 60 milligrams of the prednisolone with the topical uh, the steroids or so. That is effective. However, there's a debate at that time when we published in a uh, this kind of uh, paper in uh, 2009, I think. Uh, Schaefer, you know, a very famous uh, thing about uh, the uh, ophthalmologist and also the biologist, Schaefer support the amniotic membrane transplantation rather than the steroid. So and we are still uh, uh, very much, uh, I would say, uh, focusing on the use of the steroid. This is a still debate, but uh, the key is not a debate. The key is to minimize the cytokine storm. Either the steroid pulse therapy to, uh, to minimize the innate immunity response 
or amniotic membrane transplantation to absorb the uh, cytokine uh, our chemokines or so. Uh, now in dermatological uh, the field, uh, that they tend to use the uh, cyclosporin at the subacute phase as well or so. So I would say the message here is a key is to minimize the cytokine storm. So how do you want to do that? There is a variation also country to country and the situation to situation. Number two question. This is what surgical procedure have have been developed for the subacute and chronic phase of Stevens Johnson syndrome. There are many of them, I would say, allogenic limbo or allogenic cultivated or autologous limbo or the slip or the prosthesis, uh, autologous cultivated oral mucosa arterial transplantation, all of them, I would say. So I think I would like to pick up just one uh, uh, comet uh, uh, procedure because the Stevens Johnson syndrome is a bit different from the other uh, type of the uh, limbo stem cell deficiency because we have to manage not only for the biological problem, but also immunological problem and also microbiological problem. So I just want to say the biological problem. Because of that, we really want to stick to the autologous tissues or autologous cells. So therefore, we perform cultivated oral mucosa arterial transplantation. Because then both of the uh, limbo stem cell are already, I would say, almost 100% is dead at the time, uh, acute phase of the Stevens Johnson syndrome. Take a small back of mucosa and then I'm making a central suspension, put them onto the amniotic membrane, make the FTL cell sheet from the oral mucosa or FTL cell, takes about a couple of weeks or so, and then what kind of biological character of these? They are about the intermediate between in vivo corneal and in vivo oral mucosa arterial cells based upon gene expression profile of these uh, cell characters. So the comet is not a uh, uh, corneal FTL uh, equivalent. These are mucosa FTL stem cell transplantation. So my colleagues, uh, they're, they've been working very hard to uh, to establish this kind of surgical procedure. So we uh, published uh, these, uh, the story of the comet uh, uh, many years ago. And uh, you could see these are the uh, representative data, but uh, there's a three major, I would say, advantage. One is a visual improvement. Uh, second is an FTL heating promotion. And third is a release of the symbrephora. So this is one example, Stevens Johnson syndrome at the subacute stage phase in both eyes. It's a very in danger for the corneal infection as well. And also the FTR defect are there, conjunctivalization and symbreform. So therefore we uh, uh, try to uh, uh, fix it uh, using the comet. Uh, for the conjunctiva reconstruction uh, to the right eye and cornea reconstruction to the left eye. So this is the uh, result three months after the comet. You could see the ocular surface uh, very stabilized, but the visual acuity is still not so good. So therefore, we uh, use the limbo supported hard contact lens on them and the dramatic improvement after the use of the limbo supported hard contact lens even for these patients. So the limbo supported hard contact lens, the idea is, is quite similar to those of the Boston contact lens or the, the, some of the hard contact lens that we developed in the France or the other countries as well. But these are already approved by the Japanese government as a medical device uh, for the Stevens Johnson syndrome. And even without any surgical treatment, still the, the patient uh, could, could improve the, some of the visual acuity. So. so I think this is a kind of, in summary, three months post Stephen Johnson syndrome and subacute sub uh, uh, type of the stage, uh, I think Comet first and Limbo supported hard contact lens. And eventually we could get, uh, 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 once again, this is a champion data, but you could get uh, some of the uh, very good results. Also very scarred face, but still we could, do something uh, uh, for the patient and they, at least the patient could walk by him or by herself. So the key in this message for the 
uh, in this uh, here is an autologous comet can effectively treat ocular cicatrization and improve visual acuity. And then also the limbal supported contact lens is a useful medical device for the improvement of vision and quality of vision. So this is an, question three. What genetic predispositions are involved in Stevens Johnson syndrome with severe ocular complication? HRA, ABO, gender, mitochondrial DNA, or all of the above? I would say HRA, as you know, HRA is uh, one of the key. So Stevens Johnson syndrome with ocular complications, these are induced by, by cold medicine. If we pick up this patient, I would say HRA A0206 is closely associated with the patient with the Korean and also patient with the Japanese, but not Indian or Brazilian Caucasian. However, HRA B4403 is closely linked with the Brazilian Caucasian and also the Indians. That is very interesting. In addition to that, we've been uh, working seriously about trying to see the polymorphism of the, some of the innate gene uh, type things, and then toroid receptor 3, BP3, IKZ, F1. These are some of the uh, SNPs as uh, susceptible, multiple susceptibility gene polymorphisms are uh, existed. So uh, network balance is, if that is bad, development of the Stevens-Johnson syndrome occurred. So I think I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Professor Chie Sotozono and Dr. Mayumi Ueta, they are working seriously about the Stevens Johnson syndrome, how to manage also uh, their uh, are working of the genetic uh, analysis as well. So uh, we have the International Consortium for Genome Wide Study of Stevens Johnson syndrome, including not, not only in Japan, South Korea, India, Brazil, Chinese Taipei, UK, Germany, Thailand, and US, USA. So I hope uh, we'd like to work together. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Dr. Kinoshita, thank you so much for that. It was brilliant. Um, we're gonna spend a few moments um, for questions. So if anyone has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question to Dr. Kinoshita. Is there? <laughs> Can I ask uh, Shigoro one question, Virendra here? Yeah, Virendra. Now, if you see a patient with acute Steven Johnson in mm -hmm. your practice, what mm -hmm. is your current protocol of treatment in acute SJS, if you see within one week? Well, I think the, uh, still we are working uh, together with the dermatological department, uh, but uh, uh, we, uh, we neglect the uh, the sum of the uh, the uh, bilateral susceptible bilateral infection or the bacterial infection mycoplasma infection or so by PCR or so if there's negative we uh, we use the steroid pulse therapy with the, with, with, the, with the topical the steroid as well so intense topical steroid and IV methylprednisolone well I think we 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 use the uh, steroid eye ointment uh, uh, mainly okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? So I have a question, Dr. Kinoshita, regarding your work in 2019. You had published on IKZF1 as a marker, as a potential marker for Stevens Johnson syndrome. Um, hmm. Where are we in terms of that? Are we um, is there a clinical application currently for that? Um, where do you see that going in terms of clinical use in the future? Well, I think, uh, of course, in the HRA uh, is the uh, key, very strong association. Mm -hmm. However, there are several, I think, uh, uh, the gene uh, polymorphism, including, as I mentioned to you, Torax receptor 3 mm -hmm. and uh, EP3. They are, we know that what function they have. And also I kappa B zeta, that, that is also, there, there is a, some kind of a, a innate immunity network. Mm -hmm. Network is somewhat, uh, I, I think, uh, a bad balance. At that time, they are quite susceptible okay. to that, that uh, mm -hmm. these patients, uh, these diseases. So uh, if possible, if we have a kind of a gene array and try to uh, the survey the, all the subject before the use uh, the, some of the, uh, I think, medication or so, mm -hmm. we could uh, 
uh, prevent the onset of Stevens-Johnson syndrome? Maybe, yeah. That would be great. That would be excellent. Um, and then the other aspect, if you can speak on, is on systemic immunosuppression, Dr. Kinoshita, mm -hmm. regarding Stevens-Johnson syndrome. You're, you're talking about systemic uh, uh, immunosuppression. Yeah, other than yeah. IV methylprednisolone. Yeah, well, systemic yeah yes. I think the uh, now I, I, I briefly mentioned to you uh, in, in the dermatological field, uh, they used to uh, try to uh, not to use the steroid or the immunosuppressives. But now they had a, like a, a double blind test uh, uh, using the cyclosporine and also the steroid or something like that. Now uh, the, uh, uh, they, they, they believe the cyclosporine has a beneficial effect uh, to, uh, uh, to yeah. reduce the motor rate. So, so I think the, uh, we really have to uh, uh, examine or to investigate the use of the immunosuppressive, uh, mm -hmm. including the cyclosporine and also the like a mycophenolate, phenolate. Or something like that. Yeah. Dr. Kinoshita, thank you so much. If are there any questions? Yeah, I had one question. If it's possible. Yes. Yes, Dr. Gilady. Basically, I had few cases before monitored. The problem is them. Some of them they have chronic disease and they tend to be like even cornea melting even long after a year. I had a patient like not far away two months ago. She developed like a epithelium defect after two, a year and a half and started to melt her uh, the cornea. Do you mm -hmm. put them in systemic uh, modulator or something for these people who had chronic things? Well, at the, cr at the chronic phase, I didn't mention, I haven't talked about anything about the microbiology, but at least in a, in a Japanese patient and also the Brazilian, uh, we have found very high incidence of the colonization of the MRSA or MRCNS. So I think that that, that, that MRSA or MRCNS is also, we have to manipulate. Uh, the colonization doesn't mean infection. But, but I think we have to reduce that such a MRSA or so. So that's why, uh, for instance, uh, the, when you perform the keratoprosthesis, you really need a vancomycin eye drop source. So I think that is, that is some kind of link uh, with the uh, MRSA colonization. So, and then, uh, so I think the corneal perforation or the some kind of co corneal melting and that it, in these situation i think the uh, i i think that is case by case but uh, you have to be very careful about uh, about uh, i think bacterial infection especially mrsa can i make a comment to ashiana yes please dr sangha uh, for uh, for the same question about melting and uh, epithelial breakdown yes. in chronic uh, sjs yes that is a very common problem and uh, the way to deal with that not systemic immunosuppression but look at the lid margin. And if the lid margin is keratinized, we perform mm -hmm. uh, very aggressively and very early on lid margin mucous membrane grafting mm -hmm. and also do punctal cautery to enhance the um, uh, wetting of the ocular surface. These are not for the acute melting, but these are the steps that you can do to prevent that situation. When you have melting or when you have epithelial breakdown, you must uh, very aggressively address uh, those healing. Otherwise, you know, as uh, uh, Professor Kino said, pointed out, the epithelial stem cells are damaged. So healing in these patients is extremely, extremely slow. And uh, you do get um, sterile melting. And uh, these things are very dangerous. Thank you, Dr. Sangwan. There was a question um, on the chat. Uh, should we use topical prednisolone 1% in acute phase SJS and what is the frequency? And then Dr. Srinivasan has, a, has perhaps a point also to bring up after that. But the first question, topical prednisolone in the acute phase. Dr. Kinoshita? Oh, yes. I think 100%. I think uh, uh, you really should use the uh, uh, prednisolone, whatever, the, the steroid uh, uh, eye ointment. And... Uh, I think three, two or three or four times a day. Uh, I think, if possible, I think uh, the, that 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 is that is a key because of that that is a very severe ocular surface information because of the as I mentioned to you, cytokine storm occur. Thank you, Dr. Kinoshita. 
Dr. Srinivasan, do you have a point also? Uh, basically, what I just wanted to repeat what Dr. Sangwan had said, because in the chronic phase, the reason for the epithelial breakdown and the chronic inflammation is a component of dry eye and the lid margin, which acts as a blink-related microtrauma. So we've okay. got fairly good results with addressing this with uh, surgically excising the lid margins mm -hmm. and replacing it with the buccal mucous membrane graft. The only thing to be done to be noted is when you do these buccal mucous membrane grafts, unlike the ones that are done by the oculoplasty persons, we need the uh, mucosa to be very thin because if the mucosa becomes thick, then uh, it actually increases the friction between the lid and the ocular mm -hmm. surface. So you need a very thin mucosa to uh, you excise the keratinized tissue and you replace it with a very thin uh, buccal mucous membrane graft. And that goes a long way in improving the symptoms, improving vision, and preventing further deterioration of the ocular surface. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you. They are the expert. They are the expert <laughs> of that. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Kinoshita, Dr. Dr. Kinoshita another, another question has come on the chat. Do you use AMG in the acute stage of SJS or only topical steroids? What, 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 what you said? Yes. AMG? Do you use amniotic membrane? in the acute uh, stage or only topical steroids? Well, I think we, at the acute phase, uh, we, uh, we use the, the steroid, uh, I think, a pulse and then a, a topical steroid because the, the, the country by country, I think, for instance, in the US, most of the patients, they go to the, I think, a burn unit or so at a very acute phase, right? But for us, from the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, we, I think, ophthalmology has to manage uh, these patients. So that even though we call, we say the acute, acute is uh, the one day uh, the, the onset or uh, the, I would say the, uh, five or six, seven days onset, that is uh, already different. Uh, um, Ashkana, what I um, suggest or make a, uh, a sort of a practical recommendation, what we use here in India, Yes. Uh, the in acute SJS, uh, we mm -hmm. try and see where the patient is. If it's in the burn unit or mm -hmm. ICU, mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, in uh, LVP we started sending our uh, fellows or uh, the faculty to go and do the bedside amniotic membrane transplant mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. removing the uh, membrane. Mm -hmm. Start intense topical steroid drops mm -hmm. uh, one hourly, and also if it is safe after ruling out infection to give IV methylprednisolone. And I think the combination of these things changes the course of the disease. Mm -hmm. the, those patients may not develop as severe a sequela as if they are not treated with these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dalvoy, would you like to add anything from the U.S. perspective? Um, no, I would agree with all that said. And actually, we um, at Duke, most of our um, acute Steven Johnson syndrome, as you may remember, actually go to UNC for the burn unit. Mm -hmm. But I would agree with um, high dose topical steroids, and we're quick to do amniotic grafting too, as well to the lid margins to preserve those as, as best as possible. I think that changes their outcome long term. Great. Dr. Kinoshita, the question is any preference between topical steroids? Suspension or solution? Not suspension or solution. I think uh, in Japan, uh, we only have a beta mesazone or the dexamethasone 1% eye drops. I think uh, that we, we do. These are not, as, uh, I think, uh, that these are the solution. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any questions for Dr. Kinoshita? Okay, another question has come in, Dr. Kinoshita. What to do if Stevens Johnson syndrome? is not controlled despite systemic and topical steroid? Yeah, very difficult question. So <laughs> uh, I think at, at that time, prorate, I think we have to perform the amniotic membrane transplantation or so. But I think in our experience, uh, so far, uh, the, um, the steroid pulse therapy could manage the cytokine storm, so. Excellent. Anybody else? Any other questions for Dr. Kinoshita? Role of plasma drops, Dr. Kinoshita. Well, I think that, that, that may be effective, but uh, once again, uh, what I said, uh, the, that's, that's a very severe cytokine storm occurred. It's a, like a COVID-19 uh, in a pneumonia. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a very severe, I think, uh, cytokine storm occurs in the lab. Mm -hmm. The same is true in ocular surface. Mm -hmm. So I think the, uh, the usual management, uh, I think that is not good enough. Mm -hmm. 
What an analogy, Dr. Kinoshita, bringing in COVID-19 into Stevens Johnson. Only you would do that. That's fantastic. Well, um, we have one more question for you. And then for other questions, we're going to um, just send it across to me um, and we will, or email it in and we'll send it to Dr. Kinoshita. The final question, when do we have to stop topical steroids? Ah. That's a, that's, that's, a, that's a key, but uh, the, for us, um, I think up, up to subacute phase or so, uh, we tend to use uh, the steroids mm -hmm. and then uh, perform the, uh, like a COMET. COMET is a kind of modification of the amniotic membrane transplantation with uh, some of the, the stem cells. So I think at least uh, three or four months, and then after the surgery, we still use the, the steroids. So, so that means the steroid, we used, uh, uh, I think, up to, uh, I think, uh, one year or so, at least a topical. Excellent. Dr. Kinoshita, thank you so much for your time and for, yeah. for making it at such a late hour and um, really enlightening us. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night to you. I will be there. You will be, okay. <laughs> oh. oh, good. Good, 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 That's Dr. So nice Kinoshita. <laughs> So our next speaker is Dr. Bhaskar Srinivasan from Shankar Netralia, um, a wonderful human being that he is. He is a senior consultant at um, Shankar Netralia and Cornea and Refractive Services and just a very humble person. Um, keratoprosthesis on an on a international basis, my understanding is, is that, um, and Bhaskar, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that um, Shankar Netralia has been doing more keratoprosthesis as far as a center um, than anywhere else in the world. And um, as far as ocular surface, you are one of the three head honchos there. So uh, thank you so much for being with us. Dr. Srinivasan is going to be doing smart planning, preoperative optimization and patient selection as a multiple choice question. So if you do have questions for him, absolutely send it across. At the end of the multiple choice section, We'll do Q and A as well, but we'll start with the first question. Uh, good evening and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ashana, for inviting uh, inviting us to be a part of this. Uh, at SN, uh, we do uh, all kinds of keratoprosthesis, and probably we are two of the institutes worldwide where uh, the different kinds of keratoprosthesis, whether it's the MOKP, whether it's the Boston Type One, Type Two, or the tibial keratoprosthesis, all uh, are being done under one roof. It would be wrong to say that we are the largest center doing keratoprosthesis because okay. uh, with MOOKP, our numbers can't go or match the Boston type 1 numbers that is done uh, uh, in US. But they are for completely separate uh, subset, subsets of uh, patients. Thank you. So let's start on with the... Okay, so for those, before you start with the first question, for all the participants that are here, this is a very fun, exciting part. Just look on the side chat. A list of names was put in, okay? Dr. Guillermo Rocha, Dr. Mona Bargava, Dr. Par Parul Deshpande, Dr. Osama Gilelde, Dr. Rina, Dr. Vrindon. If you can, and if you're here, um, if you can just um, chime in on the chat that you are there so we can call on you. We'll start with Dr. Rina as answering the first question. The first question is pretty simple, and uh, Dr. Kinoshita has already answered part answered. of it. So, uh, so this one, we, we won't give it to someone. We'll give it to, uh, we'll just answer it then. Yeah. And so, we'll give Dr. Rina the next question. Next so basically, uh, all these could be causes for limbal stem cell deficiency. And if you look at the etiology, uh, uh, you can have varied etiology. You could have chemical injury causing a limbal stem cell deficiency. You could have the end stage of ocular cicatricial pemphigoid or Steven Johnson syndrome, the above three images depict almost a complete limbal stem cell deficiency. But you can also have a small subset of patients where you have a focal limbal stem cell deficiency, like in this patient who has had multiple surgeries and the limbal area is unhealthy and you have these waves of um, altered epithelium creeping in into the visual axis uh, leading to a decrease in vision. So if you look at the, uh, uh, the etiology, it's, it's a huge list, but what we normally see uh, is you need to be aware of chemical injuries, uh, iatrogenic causes, contact lens induced injury, and in the cicatrizing uh, conditions, you are looking at SJS and ocular cicatricial pemphigoid as the causes. And in a congenital cause of bilateral uh, uh, limbal deficiency, we're looking at aniridia as one of the primary uh, causes. 
So coming to the second question, uh, I would want the uh, person to grade the severity of chemical injury in this picture. This was a patient who had a bilateral chemical injury and we are looking at the grading based on the bus classification and we are looking at them giving the prognosis of the patient. So A, it's a grade 4 with a guarded to poor prognosis. It's a B, a grade 5 with a guarded to poor prognosis. A grade 4 with a guarded prognosis or a grade 6 with a guarded to poor prognosis or a grade 6 with a very poor prognosis. To you, Ashana. Yes. Uh, Dr. Rina, would you like to give us your best guess on this one? Uh, I will try uh, grade B, grade 5, guarded to poor. Uh, should I take it forward? Yes, Dr. Bhaskar. So uh, basically, uh, this is actually a grade 6 because when you look at uh, Dua's uh, classification, it talks about the corneal epithelial involvement and it talks about the conjunctival epithelial involvement. So in this picture, you can actually see the entire corneal epithelium is deepithelized and it's conjunctiva is deepithelized almost till the fornix. So you can actually see the stain reach the entire bulbar area. So almost about 100% of cornea and close to 100% of conjunctiva is involved, which makes it a grade 6 and the prognosis would actually be poor. And this is what uh, is published in 2001 uh, when Dr. Dua gave his classification. We have the other Rupert Hall classification also, but the problem with the Rupert Hall is a lot of patients who fall in the grade four of Rupert Hall would have varying outcomes of the procedure. So it was not uh, directly related to the uh, final outcome. Dua's classification gives us a better picture, even though like I come to the next slide, you might have issues even with Dua's classification. So if you look at the picture, it has a total limbus involvement and total conjunctiva. By total conjunctiva, he means fornix to fornix on the bulbar surface. So, and it, you need to ideally mention it as an analog score because sometimes you might have a total limbus involvement, but the conjunctival involvement might be less. In which case, even though technically it falls in the grade six, the outcome might actually be better because you still have conjunctival epithelium to kind of at least grow and cover the ocular surface. So if you look at the publications, uh, pictures from his publication, the first one is a grade one injury where the limbus is spared. This is a grade three where about four and a half clock hours of limbus is involved and about 30% of conjunctiva is involved. And the top and the bottom picture both are grade six. But if you look at the image, you can actually make out that this grade six is going to actually perform much better than the one below because of initial shortening, which is already set in, corneal haziness or scarring, which is already set in. So it's not just the, uh, uh, the extent of the uh, conjunctiva defect or the corneal defect. It also depends on, on the severity of the chemical which causes the uh, damage. Also, Dua doesn't speak, uh, has used the term uh, corneal involvement. He doesn't use the word limbal deficiency in the definition because whether the limbal cells are damaged or not in the acute attack is not something that we can predict at this point of time. We predict that only based on the healing response. To label uh, a, a chemical, uh, chemical burn as a limbal deficiency in the acute phase might not be uh, an accurate uh, assessment. So coming to the, the patient, uh, so this was the preoperative patient. And since we labeled it as grade six, we knew it was doing, going to be a, a bad prognosis. We decided to be a little bit more aggressive. We did an allosclet in the acute phase. And uh, there was still a, a mild epithelial defect on the side. Uh, which required a couple more of amniotics to settle. So at the end of about two months, we still had a reasonable ocular surface. Yes, there is a partial deficiency, but when you start off with this picture, I would take this in any patient. And we published our outcomes with uh, Alloslet in the acute uh, stage of chemical injury in 2017 in British Journal of Ophthalmology, where we showed a fairly good outcome. And recently in AJO, we kind of compared our results in similar grade of chemical injuries where we have used Alloslet compared to our previous data from 20, 2009 to 2014, when we were not using alloslet and we were only using amniotic membrane uh, as a comparison between both the groups. And definitely the group where we have used the alloslet seems to stabilize faster. They require less number of surgeries. The time to epithelization is much lesser. The simulacron is much lesser. And the final visual acuity in this group is much better. And the need for a corneal transplant in this group in terms of a corneal scarring because of a long-standing PED it is much lesser in the group that we have used alloslet in as compared to just a plain amniotic membrane. So we come to the uh, next question. Uh, based on the global consensus statement, this picture depicts which stage of uh, limbal stem cell deficiency. 
whether it is stage one, stage two, stage three, or stage four. We can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. So there's a question regarding the um, aspect of limbal ischemia in the classification. It doesn't mention limbal ischemia. It just mentions corneal epithelial defect, corneal defect, and limbal defect. Because ischemia uh, is difficult to, we, we are not able to image uh, the underlying vessels. You have recent publications where we have looked at uh, OCT angiography to identify the patterns, or you could do an FFA to note the uh, ischemia. So you also have a component of scleral ischemia, which comes in where we have to actually do a tenenplasty uh, and combine it with other ocular surface restoration uh, procedures in the acute phase. But Excellent. still some of the flaws in Dua's classification because it doesn't include the IOP, it doesn't include the lids leading to exposure changes, it doesn't uh, mention specifically about scleral ischemia. These would be three uh, parameters uh, that are lacking in the Dua's classification. But till we are able to image the vessels more accurately, until we are able to estimate the limbal stem cell population that is uh, that is still left without getting damaged after the acute insult, we might still not be in a situation to directly predict the final outcome of these patients. And I think to your point, Dr. Baskar, uh, regarding the vessel visualization and, and quantitative measurement, I think there was a paper in 2020 um, hot off the press regarding OCT and geography yes, exactly, yes. and um, its evaluation on limbal stem cell disease as well as uh, 3D modeling of the limbal stem cell niche. So perhaps in the future, we would have answers for this and perhaps a newer classification. Okay, so question number three. Hello? Yeah, yeah. so uh, what is the stage of limbal stem cell deficiency based on the global consensus statement? This picture depicts a stage one, it depicts a stage two deficiency, it depicts a stage three deficiency or a stage four deficiency. Great. I'm going to call on Dr. Vrinton. Dr. Vrinton, are you there? Dr. Vrinton, Klapa Korn, Korn COVID. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Are you there to be able to give your best guess at this question? There's no right or wrong, um, as in there's a right answer, but there's, this is just a, a time for us to learn and have fun. So if you're there, just let us know. And if not, if we can turn it to Dr. Thiem Hu. Thiem Hu, are you here? Take a guess, you can be 25% chance of being right. Yes, exactly, it's like, a, it's like a lottery. Okay, why don't we try Dr. Renuka Birbal? Everyone's scared of your questions, Dr. Baskar. Dr. Renuka, will you give your best guess? And, and it's, it's right or wrong, does it matter? We're all here to learn. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, actually a PhD student, so not yet an ophthalmologist. Great. So it will really be a guess, but I would say maybe stage two. Perfect. You're so, meant for ophthalmology. Yes, you're meant for ophthalmology. <laughs> okay. So the, uh, the uh, global consensus, consensus in 2018 came out uh, regarding how we should be uh, classifying limbal stem cell deficiency uh, so that when we do studies, the results are more reproducible. And this is the picture taken from the publication where they are documenting the sectoral limbal stem cell deficiency with fluorescine stain uh, in the upper picture and a total limbal stem cell deficiency in the lower picture. And they have come out uh, with the uh, definition of limbal stem cells saying that this is basically uh, an ocular surface disease and it is characterized by a decrease in the uh, corneal epithelial stem cells or the progenitor cells. And there is an inability to maintain the normal homeostasis of the ocular surface epithelium. And this leads to conjunctivalization of the surface and other signs of epithelial dysfunction, such as a persistent or a recurrent epithelial defects, which may or may not be accompanied with neovascularization, ocular surface inflammation, and scarring. So to that extent, it's an all-encompassive uh, definition, which includes most of the factors that we would see in a patient with limbal stem cell deficiency. And if you look at the staging, uh, it grades it into three stages, stage one, two, and three. The primary difference being whether the central 5 mm zone of the cornea is involved or not. If the, cent if the central 5 mm is not involved, if whether the limbal involvement is less than 50%, whether it is more than 50%, or it is 100%. And you have the pictorial uh, descriptions regarding the same on the other side. 
uh, the stage two is when the uh, central 5 mm is involved. And again, stage 2A is with less than 50% nimble involvement. And stage B is more than 50%, but less than 100% involvement. So if you look at uh, this picture of ours, you have the uh, limbal stem cell deficiency extending into the central area within the 5 millimeter zone. So it is a stage 2 and it's a stage 2A because it is less than 50% of the limbal uh, barrier which is uh, broken. So for this patient, uh, what was required was just a little bit of debridement and we combined it with an amniotic membrane and the surface healed wonderfully. We didn't have to do anything else because it's a very focal deficiency. It got addressed just by a simple measure. Some more examples, this patient with an ocular surface tumor who was treated with topical mitomycin C, uh, then developed limbal deficiency. So if you look at just the slit image, uh, you cannot actually make out the extent of the limbal deficiency. But the moment you put your fluorescein and stain and look at the uh, corneal epithelial pattern, you can recognize that the deficiency is almost about eight clock hours. So this, the central 5mm is involved. It is more than 50% of your uh, limbal involvement. So this comes in stage 2B. And the lower picture where the central cornea is reasonably spared and has less than 50% involvement of the upper limbus alone would come as a stage 1A. So it's important when you're talking about limbal deficiency to use fluorescein to stain your ocular surface because the pulling of fluorescein on the ocular surface gives you a very good clue as to what is the uh, amount or extent of limbal deficiency that you are dealing with. Excellent. And that answered the question just now. Yes. Um, Sorry, so keep this, going. Just finish you... So there's another uh, classification of the stem cell deficiency, which is given by uh, Ed Holland, where he basically classifies it as partial or total, and then uh, classifies it based on presence or absence of inflammation. So, so indications like aniridia, contact lens, would actually have a fairly good prognosis, even though they are partial or they are total, whereas uh, some uh, eyes with uh, significant conjunctival inflammation like SJS, OCP, even with the stem cell uh, reconstruction, the outcomes might not be as good. And this was mentioned uh, in a lot of their publications on uh, uh, the Cincinnati procedure uh, and the modified Cincinnati procedure. So before we go on to this question, we have a question. Grade five, six injury, uh, according to Dua's classification, I'm assuming, is the question, alloslet or primary AMG tenonplasty followed by autoslet after two to four months, which would give a better outcome? The aim of alloslet in the acute phase is not for vision. The aim of alloslet in the acute phase is to get the epithelium on the ocular surface as soon as possible. In a chemical injury, when you have a total corneal epithelial defect, the, uh, as, assuming your limbus has got damaged, then you expect the conjunctival epithelium to migrate and cover the cornea. But if your conjunctiva is also significantly damaged, you don't have cells to migrate and cover the ocular surface. It takes much longer. Even if you put an amniotic, amniotic doesn't have epithelial cells to cover. It acts as a basement membrane over which your conjunctival epithelium has to grow. So if there is shortage of conjunctival epithelial cells, it's going to take a longer time for the amniotic to succeed by itself. You will require much, many more attempts at doing an amniotic membrane in the acute phase to epithelize the ocular surface. And if, it, if the ocular surface remains deepithelized for a longer period of time, it will result in corneal scarring, corneal thinning, and you might actually end up requiring a corneal transplant in the chronic phase. The idea of getting a cover on top is not something new. It's been there even uh, in 2009. There was a publication where they said they've, where they've used an, a comet sheet in an acute chemical injury uh, so that you get an epithelium on as fast. And the moment you have an epithelium on, the surface inflammation significantly comes down. But that would involve a lab. It would involve a lot of other logistics that you would need to be uh, ready with. Uh, and you never know when you would get a chemical injury. So if you have to grow the cells on the lab, it takes you at least 14 days. Whereas uh, with the alloslet, you do get tissues reasonably. And you're not looking at optical grade tissues. You're only looking at tissues which you have harvested within 48 hours. Uh, tissues with a reasonable limbal conjunctival uh, uh, bits, which you can use uh, to generate the epithelium to cover the ocular surface faster. Excellent. And autoslet is advisable only after a period of six months. You want the eye to quieten down before you touch the autolimbus cells and transplant it into the other eye. Is it limbal inflammation or limbal ischemia in acute chemical injury? How to differentiate is a question. Limbal, 
limbal ischemia, unfortunately, has got something which has been labeled in all our books and it's come right from the Thoff's definition and uh, Ruperhaus definition. Limbal ischemia, initially when you see, it is very difficult for you to comment because the conjunctiva itself might be chemotic. So you are not sure what is uh, happening. Inflammation, any chemical injury is going to cause inflammation. That's the reason why when Dua published his classification, he did not use either of these two terms. He used corneal involvement and he used conjunctival involvement because you cannot quantify uh, the ischemic component. The limbal deficiency also is, is a factor which comes with healing. It's not something that you can predict right at the beginning. Like the case that I showed where it was almost a grade six, probably the uh, acid did not penetrate in as deep. So there was some amount of surviving limbal cells there with, which was able to replenish the ocular surface. Whereas the, uh, the other picture which was shown in Dua's publication, the one which was lower, had a lot more of uh, um, ocular surface damage that even with multiple surgeries, we might not be able to uh, um, re-epithelize the surface successfully for us to plan for any kind of stem cell uh, treatment sub subsequently. Mm -hmm. Another question, can Dr. Srinivasan show how to make out limbal stem cell deficiency on fluorescein staining? Uh, limbal, uh, we can go back to the slide. So this, this whirling pattern of, of uh, if, you, if you stay in a normal cornea, you will get this. This is a normal corneal phenotype. This is a conjunctival phenotype because the conjunctival epithelium is different as compared to the corneal epithelium. You have the fluorescein pool between the conjunctival uh, folds and that is why you get this whirl pattern. And this is important for you to quantify the deficiency. If you look at this, you see a vascularization here, but you cannot actually estimate the amount of limbal deficiency till you put your fluorescein in. So when you do any stain, look at how the cornea, uh, normal corneal fluorescein stain looks like. And then you look at this pattern. This will tell you the extent of limbal deficiency. Bhaskar, can I just comment on uh, what you just said? Sure, sir. So, um, see what your picture or slit limb photo where it shows a pen, uh, sort of a, a focal uh, area of limbal stem cell deficiency. In, in these kind of pictures, you may not be able to uh, make an assessment how much is the extent. So, flor fluorescent staining is helpful in situations where there is a early mild limbal stem cell deficiency. If you are moderate to severe, which is very obvious, you see the conjunctivalization. A pen is going on uh, over the limbus, conjecture are being dragged onto the cornea. So when the vision doesn't improve in a patient and the cornea looks okay, then you put the stain and look at how the corneal uh, epithelium looks like, how the limbus looks like. That will help you in making that uh, diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we proceed with the next question? Or? Yes, we will do a, another question. So this is related to the... Uh, and, this, um, and the person we'll uh, request is Dr. Parul. Dr. Parul, would you mind answering this question for us? Yeah. Taking your best guess? Yeah, uh, I'm, not very, I'm not very sure. No, not a big deal, not Maybe, a big deal. Um, is it the first this patient uh, without matching? Yeah, so I, let me read out the question first, so you yeah. can ask okay. Parul. Yeah. Yes, yeah, <laughs> a patient with uh, bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency who requires a live related conjunctival limbal allograft. And uh, who would the donor be? You could use any re living relative as the donor. You could re uh, use a first degree relative, but you don't bother about matching. You use an ABO compatible match alone is sufficient. You do an ABO compatible match along with a PRA, which is 60% uh, with a DSA, which is negative. This is panel reactive antibody, and this is donor specific antigen. And you do uh, ABO compatibility with a PRA of zero and DSA is negative, or you do an ABO compatible with PRA of 60 with DSA of positive. Uh, <laughs> take a guess. I'm not sure. I, I'm have to, even I had to read the paper. <laughs> I'm going to go to B. So, this actually has been uh, very well covered uh, in the paper by Ed Holland and um, Arthur is already here as, as, as one of the panelists and he's authored uh, the uh, publication. So the answer is uh, you're looking at an ABO compatible match with a panel reactive antibody, which is as low as possible and a donor specific antigen, which is uh, negative because these will uh, improve the matching between the donor and the recipient, which will reduce the risk of your uh, body uh, rejecting the transplanted tissue. And uh, this is published uh, in 2018 uh, when they have looked at the donor screening uh, and selection. 
and they have also published it with respect to the modified Cincinnati procedure as to how they would select the conjunctival autografts uh, in patients uh, where they are uh, planning this procedure. And in fact, uh, to a large extent, uh, they have shifted from doing a keratolimbal allograft to doing a live uh, related conjunctival limbal uh, allograft because they are able to better match the uh, donor to the recipient. And like you, you always compare a limbal uh, allograft to a, a solid organ, a solid organ transplant. So in solid organ transplants also, there is a better success of matched uh, tissues as compared to unmatched. There are better, better uh, results with a living tissue as compared to a cadaveric uh, tissue. Similarly, when you compare the live-related tissue versus a keratolimbal allograft, uh, in their series, they have showed uh, the live-related uh, allografts had lesser rejection and uh, lesser rejection, improved graft survival, and better vision uh, as uh, as an outcome. This is ba quite Baskar, Baskar, can I, can I'll, come I... your point, sir. I'll come to select. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 select. I want to uh, make a comment about the question and Parul's answer. I will, I will select uh, uh, option number two and uh, the rationale for, um, for me uh, is uh, because for a limbal donor, you really don't have much choice. Uh, it's not like a blood donor where you can screen so many donors. So for somebody who will allow you to stick a uh, Caesar in your eye, will be only family members and, and also the amount of immunosuppression you give despite perfect match, it really doesn't matter much. So in terms of simplicity, and if your uh, ability to do these things, I will just select the first uh, degree relative donor, mother, father, yeah, or sibling. Closest match you can select. In our scenario, that becomes a lot more practical. What they have published is uh, they have been uh, able to get matches in almost about 80% of their patients, which was reasonably well matched. Uh, and per donor, they required about two donors that they had to uh, check till they were able to, on an average, 1.7 donors is what they have published. But obviously, a US scenario and an Indian scenario is- But, but totally Bhaskar, different. we have published five-year lim five year limbal allograft survival of 76% at five year with uh, triple drug re re immunosuppression which is systemic steroid, azathioprine, and cyclosporin. So with this and also no uh, matching at all. So if you do all matching and uh, all uh, everything else, maybe you improve the um, uh, outcomes by another 5-10% uh, percent. 85 is what they are they're quoting. But you remember the cost of treatment goes very high. Very high yes. So you have to balance both the things. Yes, definitely. Dr. Chung also chime in yes. on this because he's the author yes. of the paper. So I, I agree. So <laughs> it does, does depend if you have the facilities and the ability to uh, to test. Um, as you were saying, Dr. Simon, you know, family, a, a dad and mom, you know, are going to be 50% compatible anyways. So if that's your only choice, then yeah, you can just go with that. Um, if you do have the opportunity, especially siblings, um, and you have the facilities to test, then I think that it's better to test um, because then you can see who's an actual, possibly 100% match because that, that could de probably decrease the amount of systemic suppression long-term um, and your outcomes. Yeah, and also if you if, if the affordability. See, for you, in being in the U.S. and the kind of healthcare system you have, probably these things are uh, done automatically. But for us, we need to pay attention um, overall uh, the cost of managing the uh, situation. Even the cost of immunosuppression becomes a problem. Yes. It, it is a very uh, big issue. Yeah, so, exactly. So availability and then, of course, to the uh, cost to the patient. I agree. So this, this was basically uh, from his paper uh, where they're looking at donor and how they have uh, how they plan their uh, workup of a donor. So I think you can read up the um, publication. Uh, it's fairly clear in that. So being a patient with uh, limbal deficiency, you need to know whether you're looking at a unilateral deficiency or a bilateral. Unilateral deficiency with the phonics, which is obliterated, you try to form the phonics. If it's successful, then you go on to the uh, next, where you're looking at the underlying cornea under the panis. If it's healthy, you might plan for a limbal stem cell transplants, either a CLAU, SLET, CLET, or a modified Cincinnati. If the underlying cornea is thin, 
you might want to combine the LK along with the stem cell transplant, or you might want to do the LK first, like a large corneal scleral LK, followed by the stem cell uh, auto transplant subsequently. And if the underlying cornea is scarred, but it is reasonably uh, thick, it's not thin, you might just do the limbal stem cell transplant first, see the improvement in corneal clarity, and then follow it up by a PK or an LK later. If you're looking at a bilateral deficiency, again, you go across whether it's phonics is formed. If it's formed, you're looking at whether the surface is keratinized or conjunctivalized. A keratinized surface would be an option for keratoprosthesis. A conjunctivalized surface would again go back whether the cornea is thin, whether the cornea is normal or the cornea is scarred. And you plan for a limbal stem cell transplant. This is going to be from a keratolimbal donor or a live-related donor or an alloslet or a comet. If limbal stem cell transplant fails, you have the option of keratoprosthesis where you could do the type 1 since the phonics is formed or the MOOKP. And if it's a bilateral with a phonics which is obliterated, again, you could directly go for the keratoprosthesis where it could be the OOKP or the Boston type 2. Or you could go to try to form the phonics. If it fails, you go ahead with the keratoprosthesis. If it is successful, you go ahead like in the previous slide with a limbal stem cell transplant with or without a PK. And if that fails, go for keratoprosthesis. Yes, yes. Excellent, excellent. So uh, stay tuned. This is next month's session, I banking and COVID-19, what next? We have a fantastic lineup uh, coming up on July the 19th, Sunday, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and 7.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, uh, looking at all the issues on how COVID-19 is going to affect us as corneal transplant surgeons, as well as the eye bank. So it's definitely of importance to all of us. So stay tuned for that. So alphabet soup, let's focus in and hone in on limbal stem cell techniques. I have no relevant financial disclosures, and it's a perfect segue from what Dr. Srinivasan talked about just now regarding uh, who do we choose for what? So let's talk about partial limbal stem cell deficiency first, okay? In partial limbal stem cell deficiency, if the visual axis is not affected, topical lubrication alone suffices. However, if the visual axis is affected, then the next aspect is, is your adnexal affected or not? If it is uh, affected, go ahead and correct that abnormality. But if not, and there is fibrovascular uh, panis, you can consider doing a, a sequential sector conjunctival epitheliectomy with or without amniotic membrane. Uh, that is one option or stem cell therapy, which we'll talk about shortly. Now, if you don't have fibrovascular panis and your adnexa is not affected, then you can just proceed with this uh, procedure. Okay, total limbal stem cell deficiency. You are faced with the same questions in the beginning. Is your axis affected? No, topical lubrication suffice it. If your adnexa is affected, then correction of uh, the abnormality is of utmost importance because your limbal stem cell transplant would otherwise fail. If it is not affected, your question is unilateral or bilateral. So in unilateral, what are our options for stem cell therapies? If autologous from the self alone, you have conjunctival limbal autograph, SLET, CLET, COMET, and allergenic options, options from other sources besides the self would be allergenic CLET, taking cultivated stem cells from another source, be it living related or cadaveric, Living related conjunctival limbal autograft, either uh, either a, a, a donor, a, a parent, a, a sibling, and we'll go into that later, or cadaveric KLAL. What about your bilateral? So when you have bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, the first focus should be your ocular surface. Is it dry? If it's dry, or if there are other issues such as um, you know a cost issue. Um, or if there is systemic immunosuppression issues where patients cannot tolerate immunosuppression, keratoprosthesis may be uh, a, a valid and the ideal um, procedure of choice. However, if your ocular surface is wet, you have the choice of a K-Pro or stem cell therapies. Now, how is it different? Well, not much, except for the fact that you don't have conjunctival limbal uh, autograft as mentioned in bold, and 
Slet and clet are options. Comet is an option. However, um, slet currently the studies are rare and few, and Dr. Sangwan can guide us in on this as well on ter in terms of bilateral. But if we are doing bilateral slet, then immunosuppression is of the utmost importance. Okay, and what about the Cincinnati procedure? So the Cincinnati procedure is severe unilateral or bilateral disease treatment where we combine your living related conjunctival limbal autograph with a keratolimbal allograft. And unilateral disease modified Cincinnati combining the conjunctival limbal autograft with keratolimbal allograft. So let's go through it step by step. I'm going to go through the nine major procedures, okay? Starting with the, the autologous limbal stem cell techniques. The first one being conjunctival limbal autograft, which is surgically harvest of the conjunctiva and limbal tissue from the contralat contralateral eye. You have between two to four strips that you use uh, from the superior and inferior donor limbus and there is direct transfer into the recipient eye. So the bonus here is you have one procedure. The limitation, however, is, is that it's for unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency. There is the risk to the donor eye, okay? And live donor is uh, present, is, is, is what is necessary, so you can only take a part of the limbus. Um, and if this procedure does fail, then, uh, then it's, a, it's problematic as you, you cannot go back to, that, to the contralateral eye. You would have to consider other options. What about autologous CLET? Well, in CLET cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation, you have harvest of limbal stem cells from the contralateral eye. There's ex vivo expansion into limbal epithelial cell sheets. And so it makes this a staged procedure, which can be very tedious, okay? Um, there is the risk, though minimal, to the donor eye. It requires the presence of the healthy uh, donor and preserved limbus. And with ex vivo stem cell expansion, you're dealing with all kinds of potential problems, including that it can fail. You can get a poor um, biopsy. It's time consuming and it's expensive. So SLET, we have with us Dr. Sangwan, who innovated the simple limbal epithelial transplantation in 2012, which combines CLAU and CLET. There's a harvest of limbal stem cells from the contralateral eye, and there's direct transfer of the limbal stem cells into the recipient eye. So it's one stage, it's cost effective, there is the risk to the donor eye, but minimum. Um, and it's primarily been studied in unilateral disease. Long-term efficacy is not yet known, though since 2012, studies have shown excellent efficacy. And finding out data regarding SLET um, with keratoplasty is still yet to be seen. Comet, cultivated oral mucosa epithelial transplantation is harvest from your oral mucosa. Here we have ex vivo expansion of the epithelial stem cell sheets. It's a staged procedure and it's cumbersome. You do have the uh, benefit of those additional cells in cases where you have bilateral disease, but the same issues apply. It can fail, it's time consuming and expensive. So as of 2020, there has been a rabbit model on simple oral mucosal epithelial transplantation, direct transfer from the oral mucosa into the ocula, in, into, onto the ocular surface, which has shown good results, but yet we don't know much. Time has yet to show as to whether or not that would be efficacious for us in humans. So how do we go about cultivating corneal epithelial stem cells? Well, before we used to have the 3T3 fibroblasts, but now we um, have amniotic membrane. Two by two millimeters of conjunctival epithelium is dissected from the area and transported into the lab into human corneal epithelium medium. In the lab donor, limbal tissue is shredded into small bits and a three by four millimeter amniotic membrane sheet 
is de-epithelialized and bits of limbal tissue is explanted over it, basement membrane side up. It's incubated at 37 degrees with 5% CO2 and 95% air. And cultures come in about two to three, 10 to 14 days, two to three weeks is when you would get about two to three centimeters in diameter for then transplantation. So what about our allergenic limbal stem cell transplant techniques? There's three major ones and then the two combination ones that we should know about. So with allergenic collet, we have ex vivo expansion of limbal stem cell into the limbal epithelial cell sheath. It's for unilateral or bilateral disease because it's coming from another donor, which is either living or cadaveric. And the benefit here is that it's single procedure. Limitations, of course, with any allergenic procedure, just seal it, is immunosuppression is required, okay? Ex vivo stem cell uh, aspects that are, that are, you know, of concern we've mentioned, but very important that that is something that is of concern. And if you don't have that available to you, then it may not be the ideal procedure. Living related conjunctival limbal allograft. Similar to the CLAU technique, technically, surgically, it's for unilateral or bilateral disease, okay? Living-related donor as compared to your KLAL, which is cadaveric. The donor and recipient immunologic matching based on blood type and antigens is of key importance, and Dr. Baskar has gone through some of this already with us. The tissue is fresher than KLAL, and similar issues remain with immunosuppression, risk to the donor, live donors, so you can only take part of it. And so if it fails, then another alternative has to be found. With KLAL, you have the option, because it's cadaveric, to use the 360 degree ring, consisting of the entire donor eye cell. Those cells, because they're cadaveric, they're not as fresh. And so that can be of consequence to the outcomes in these situations. Tissues tend to not be immunocompatible, uh, and there tends to be a high risk of rejection and failure rate over five years. Now, Cincinnati procedure, we've gone through this, but I want to just really hold on because there are some people um, who have registered who really want to learn step by step how to do this. So, with the Cincinnati procedure, living related conjunctival limbal allograft plus KLAL, the living donor tissue is. Uh, a relative, severe unilateral or bilateral disease, living donor tissue, okay, is for your six o'clock and your 12 o'clock meridians, whereas your cadaveric tissue is sutured on to your three o'clock and nine o'clock meridians. The limitations here combine the, the disadvantages of uh, both. So you have the immunosuppression risk, you have the risk to the patient, the living donor's uh, ocular surface. If it fails, another, another option has to be found. And KLAL, you have the issues of graft rejection and immunocompatibility. So the modified Cincinnati procedure is excellent as well. CLAU, which is contralateral plus KLAL. So the living donor tissue is from yourself. It doesn't have the immunocompatibility issues. Severe unilateral disease is its indication. And living donor tissue and cadaveric are sutured in a similar fashion as the Cincinnati procedure. Living tissue at six o'clock and 12 o'clock, cadaveric at three o'clock and nine o'clock. With this, you have risk um, and Procedure, the procedure cannot be repeated if it fails, okay? You have the risk to the other eye. Immunosuppression is required because you do have KLAL as part of this, okay? So there is the, the high risk of rejection in this case. So what is hot off the press? Well, up until fresh today, 142 publications um, show up in PubMed under limbal stem cells, categorized under, I would say, surgical techniques, pathophysiology, stromal stem cells, Limbal stem, cell diagnostic, limbal stem cell deficiency diagnostics and immunosuppression. So part of the topic of advancements, I really wanted to, us to go through this 
in an overall nutshell. So looking at surgical techniques and outcomes, hot off the press is this article in April, Outcomes of Limbal Stem Cell Transplant, a meta-analysis, looking at 40 studies, over 2,000 eyes, okay? And what did they find? As far as the improvement of ocular surface, it was the autologous uh, that superseded over the allogenic procedures. Visual improvement rates also were better with your autologous procedures. And they found that ultimately limbal stem cell transplants overall can improve or stabilize the corneal surface with a low rate of severe ocular complications. But that autologous limbal stem cell transplants may have a higher success rate and fewer complications than your allogenic limbal stem cell therapies. Another very interesting one, when we are doing SLET, the question that comes to mind is, where do you exactly take your piece? Where are the most limbal stem cells? And so this paper actually looked at your um, cornea, your, the conjunctiva adjacent, your middle, and your cornea aspect. And what they found was, is that there tends to be a greater uh, predominance of limbal stem cells in your conjunctival and your middle area as compared to the cornea. So something to keep in mind when it comes to future SLET procedures that we're doing. And the expression of NP63 and the ABC were also tested in your conjunctiva and your middle areas, and they were shown to be um, present. Those are markers that we already know have been shown to be effective as far as successful limbal stem cell transplantations. And I talked about SOMET, okay? And this is a diagram of how it looks like. In the top left, you will see the SOMET eye, and the top right, your control eye. And you can see how the fluorescein um, staining is after one week, far better in your SOMET. And then completely, um, the epithelium has completely epithelialized over in two weeks time in your SOMET eye. So time will tell how this will uh, work for humans. Key articles as far as surgical techniques in 2019 to 2020, alloslet. Alloslet has been found to be better than amniotic membrane for early phase of chemical injury grade four and above. There was an article on PKP following CLAW, CLAU, and what they found was waiting for at least one year post-claw transplantation to perform PK will increase corneal clarity. However, the other aspect that they brought up is that even if the eyelids were reconstructed properly, it still continues to remain a major risk factor for epithelial disorders to occur in both the early and late post-operative periods. Now, comparing CLAL versus KLAL, this was already mentioned regarding cases of bilateral total limbal stem cell deficiency that living-related CLAL de demonstrates lower rejection rates, improved graft survival compared with CL KLAL. An allogenic CLET, okay, there was a series of 10 cases regarding bilateral total limbal stem cell deficiency, okay, and what they found was that it can be considered for uh, burns and congenital etiologies such as aniridia, but because of the high failure rate, a lot of it is contributed to immunologic diseases, idiopathic cannabis, et cetera. There was an interesting uh, case report on plasma rich, uh, platelet risk rich plasma and its integration in with allogenic limbal epithelial transplant and how could that potentially be of use for patients with Stevens-Johnson syndrome in the future. Allogenic CLET versus cultivated or autologous oral mucosal epithelial sheets. That was actually, no. that was done by Dr. Chung, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it was a comparison between studies, but it was found to be very difficult due to the lack of a universal and objective grading tool. The definition of clinical improvement was problematic. And, but what they could propose and conclude is that autologous comet, there was no risk of immune activation and no immunosuppression. 
of course, but increased risk of persistent epithelial failure compared with allergenic clay. PROSE has also been effective as far as limbal stem cell diseases. Case report was also there regarding corneal neurotization. So we have yet to see whether corneal neurotization and those procedures can actually be effective for corneal and limbal epithelial uh, stem cell deficiency as well. Smile lenticules have been used with human-induced pluripotent stem cells from the recipient patient themselves for patients requiring keratoplasty. So if you, and this is particularly for limbal stem cell deficiency as a new resource for corneal tissue engineering because of its minimal risk of graft rejection. So if you have smile access and, uh, and are heavy into limbal stem cell practice, this is something to consider for us, but too early for us to tell the results. SLET, of course, is our, our, our mainstream. 31 articles were reviewed in a current paper since 2012, and, and success so far has shown that it is comparable with CLAU and CLET. Xeno-free alternatives for culturing limbal epithelial stem cells for CLET were also evaluated this year, as well as COMET, uh, oral mucosa, um, xeno-free alternatives for oral mucosa uh, trans, uh, ex vivo explantation as well in cultivation. Autologous transplantation of the conjunctiva by modifying SLET was also looked at, and femtosecond laser-assisted KLAL. Okay, here are some of the highlights as far as diagnostics. These are the last few slides. I just want to give you the highlights of 2019 to 2020, since this is all about advancement. So regarding diagnostics, the top five were a custom-made web-based grading system, that was developed for grading deficient eye, limbal stem cell deficiency eyes after the treatment, okay? Use of OCT angiography to provide novel quantitative and non-invasive ways to assess limbal stem cell deficiencies. Perhaps 3D modeling, as we mentioned earlier. ASOCT to look at certain markers, particularly three-point measurement of corneal central corneal epithelial thickness was noted to be a reliable diagnostic marker and keratograph 5M non-invasive tear breakup time. As far as pathophysiology, anti-VEGF was tried and it, the results were not great. So um, it actually led to delays in wound closure. So that's something that we may have to consider holding off if one was considering doing concurrently with limbal stem cell transplantation. Polycrine generated cells, label enriching cells were found to be uh, present in the limbus. Human adipose mesenchymal stem cells may have a possible via viable uh, option, maybe a viable option for us for epithelial stem cell transplantation in the future. Ocular surface in, stem, in Stevens Johnson syndrome, there's an increased proportion of pathogenic species, Pseudomonas staph, strep, as you know. So Bacter was shown in Stevens Johnson as compared to the normal. Tryptase phenotype, keratin 12 mRNA expression, and specific features regarding glaucoma surgery. And the differences that you have in limbal stem cell deficiency with glaucoma surgery, namely that you don't have your corneal neovascularization and panis. The site of glaucoma surgery was strongly correlated with the location of limbal stem cell deficiency. There was increased severity of limbal stem cell deficiency in eyes with two or more glaucoma surgeries as compared to one. Topical glaucoma medications are co correlated with limbal stem cell uh, deficiency severity, but not anti-metabolites. There was no found uh, result there. What about the um, this we've gone through, OCT, 3D modeling, the vascularization case integrity web-based tool, ASOCT, and keratograph. And immunosuppression, there was a large paper that compared immunosuppression um, for allergenic limbal, epi limbal epithelial grafting and limbal epithelial cell transplantation. 
oral cyclosporin A at different doses was the most common immunosuppression agent. However, different studies did show that oral mycophenolate and tacrolimus also reported good results. And we're going to go into much more detail with Dr. Chung's uh, paper uh, topic on this. Cyclosporin in Stevens-Johnson syndrome, interestingly, as an initial therapy, was found to be no difference compared to no treatment alone. So that's something uh, to keep note of. Epithel and as far as adjunctive therapies, epidermal growth factor ointment could reduce corneal um, uh, persistent epithelial defects in limbal stem cell deficiency, as can autologous serum tears in medically reversing specific types of limbal stem cell deficiency. So with that, I want to thank everyone. Uh, thank all the great faculty for being here with us. And my mentors, Sadhu Vaswani and Dada Vaswani, who are my, um, who are my inspirations. Um, this next phase, we're going to answer questions and I will answer it individually. But I want to take the next 15 minutes or so to do something very unique. You know, no matter how many papers we write and review in this world of, of research and the world of ophthalmology, no matter how much we dig, 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 the question is, what are we digging for? Do we ever spend time digging into ourselves? And I think that in this time of COVID, where peace and love is very important and sharing that is very important with the world, I would urge you that in these next 15 minutes of relaxation, it's going to be an audio uh, meditation. Take the time to just start digging into yourself and sending out your positive vibrations to all. Meditation is the key to living a more rewarding, fulfilling, peaceful life. It helps you discover who you really are and what your true potential is. It enhances your ability to face life and its challenges. Meditation is not strenuous or difficult. It is simple and life-changing. The positive energy and healing vibrations of group meditations are tremendous. The force of group meditations has a great impact on every member of the group. Meditation begins with relaxation. Most of our time we are tense without realizing it. We need to relax consciously allowing the stressed out and exhausted mind to rest. There are many ways of relaxation. Each one of us must follow the one that best suits him or her. I will but indicate to you today one simple method. in a comfortable posture with the back straight as far as possible let the back the neck and the head be in a straight line close your eyes and take a deep breath and exhale do this a few times Le 
let your face wear a smile. Now sit still and breathe normally. Imagine yourself in the loving, the immediate and the personal presence of the Lord, your beloved. You are sitting at his lotus feet, your arms around his ankles, your head resting on his feet. Say to yourself, here is true rest, here is true relaxation. Now, relax the body, every muscle of the body. To relax a muscle, you must first tighten it and then release it. Remember that all the while you are in the loving, immediate, personal presence of God. We will now move from one limb to another by tightening it and then releasing it. Let us begin. Bring your attention to your feet. Tighten and relax. Legs. Tighten and relax. buttocks, squeeze tight and let go, abdomen, tuck it in and relax, chest, expand and relax, shoulders, Lift them upwards and drop them down. Raise your arms and drop them. Turn your attention to your neck. Gently turn it from one side to another. Arms stretch tight and relax. 
hands tighten into fists and relax. 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 Let go. Let go. And let God. Now tighten your whole body and relax. Repeat this three times. Take a deep breath. Allow your stomach to expand. As you breathe in, hold the breath for a few seconds and then breathe out through your mouth, allowing your body to completely relax. Now rub the palms of your hands together and gently, very gently, place them on your eyes and open them. Continue to smile. Thank yourself for this beautiful gift of a few precious minutes of peace. Slowly turn your gaze around and become aware of your surroundings. This is the end of the meditation. Om Shanti 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 I don't think I have words. I think I'm, uh, I think I feel like being in silence for a lot longer. There's, um, there's a lot to be said about something beyond what we do. What we do is very important and it, and it cherishes eyes and it saves people's eyes and makes a huge difference. But to do what you all do every day, take something with yourself. Take that energy, that light, that love into your practices. May I take that. May you bless me to take that with me so that we may be better human beings, better doctors. I'd like to hand over the platform to someone who is really a beautiful human being, Dr. Melissa Dalavoy. She was my fellowship director at Duke for Cornea and Refractive Surgery Fellowship. The way that she handles human beings and the way that she takes care of the disabled um, is, is, is extremely touching. And I don't think she herself knows the, the special touch that she has in, in the lives of so many patients. She's a fantastic surgeon and um, a good friend. And um, I can read off her CV, but I think that uh, for someone like that to be here with us, I'm super honored. Dr. Dalavoy, I hand it over to you for E equals MC squared complex limbal stem cell surgery. Well, thank you for that introduction. It was so sweet. I'm not sure my voice is the one that you want to break. 
um, that beautiful silence. And I know we're running behind, so I'll try to speed things up and not be redundant. Um, but let me share my screen and I'll basically go through some cases um, to put what we've learned together here. If I can get it to move. So I'm just gonna go through um, each, each procedure that we have similar to what Ashiana just went through starting with the conjunctival limbal autograph. So I won't, I won't repeat all of this, but in basic, you're using the patient's um, unaffected eye to transplant limbal stem cells to the affected eye. And the biggest benefit that I see here is of course, no need for um, immunosuppressive and um, less risk of rejection. And so here, similar to her schematic, this is borrowed from Ed Holland, taking healthy cells from the healthy eye, 360 pyridomy, a superficial keratectomy, and then transplanting those cells. Um, so here's the first case. This is an alkaline burn um, on his right eye. His vision was 2400 and an unaffected left eye. So here he is pre-op. This is post-op, um, month one, not looking particularly fantastic, but it does improve over time. He reached 2200 and 2080 and then saw about 2040 with a scleral lens spinning. So he did quite well. This is another case of a firecracker injury. And this was early on in my career. And I learned a lot from this case. It kind of puts a few things together. Um, and so here's a close up look. This was a severe um, chemical slash thermal burn with um, some sublepharon here and basically 360 neovascularization. So she was hand motion here, really worried about her cosmesis, um, just generally unhappy. And so I did an um, allograft. This is three weeks out. She was still count fingers, but what I love about this photo is you can see my sutures here of the graft and how it's beginning to clear. Um, previously, we had done some lid reconstruction, basically making, releasing some of this in blepharon and um, getting rid of some of this conjunctiva and then went in and did the limbal stem cell transplant. But you can see centrally here, she still has those dense neovascularization. And what I learned here is in a case this severe, doing just the six and 12 o'clock positions with an autograph is probably not going to be enough. Um, so let's see, let's fast forward. And she looks cosmetically a lot better. Um, she was able to see 2200 and pinholes to 2050 at her best, but we still struggle with some of these vessels coming through and we've done repeated amniotic membrane um, and some contact lenses to try to help with that. This is her left eye where we took the graft and it was unaffected and you'd be hard pressed to tell that we did anything there. But what I learned here is that you really need to address 360 in these um, really bad little stem cell cases. And I've actually offered a, her to have some more grafting done, but she's declined, she's happy where she is. This was an iatrogenic case of conjunctival melanoma. So she was 2020. But this was diagnosed as melanoma and had some trouble with her mitomycin topical therapy and uh, injured her limbal stem cells. Her epithelium was quite rough and she decreased vision to 2200 and eventually hand motion. We can see here the irregularity. So this is pretty quickly after her autologous limbal stem cell transplant. She got to 2060 um, and by month six, her epithelium had improved such that she was 2020 um, without correction. So she was quite happy. Closer up picture. So keratolimbal allograft is where you'll take limbal stem cells, sorry, living related conjunctival limbal autograft is where you'll take living stem cells from a living related donor um, or a cadaver. And this is indicated where the other eye is at risk or a bilateral disease. And again, here's a schematic from Ed Holland, 360 pyridomy, superficial um, keratectomy. And then you're gonna take the peripheral uh, Limbal, corneal limbal aspect of a donor graft where you actually remove the center that you would normally use for a PK. And it typically takes more than one eye because usually two is just not enough to get 360 in these cases. So this was a severe atopic disease. She had been kind of misdiagnosed and mismanaged. And so her disease by the time we saw her was quite severe. She had a K-Pro done in the other eye. And I really didn't want to give her two K-Pros um, because I find that once complications happen, there's really no, no going back from there in a, in a tape for eye. So she had declined to about a count fingers vision. And this is um, about a one month post-op. And again, I just like what it shows. This is the edge of the, of the cadaver graft. And then you can see the epithelium kind of marching forward. She still has a central epi defect here, but it just shows the progression. 
but she did achieve a best corrected vision of 2040. And she did well for quite a number of years. There's a post-op picture. But she, when she moved away, she came off of her immunosuppressives and actually had some acute rejection. So we tried treating with oral steroids, topical steroids, but decided um, it was non-recoverable. And this is a short video of her repeat graft, um, just to show you how, how kind of tough and, and messy some of these cases can be. So here I'm just getting underneath the previous graft. Um, this isn't your typical cataract surgery here. And they were quite easy to dissect um, once you got up and under and a little release of some scar tissue and I was able to easily remove um, all of the graft. And I thin out um, with a lamellar dissection of the donor tissue, um, just so it's not such a big step off. Um, you don't need to, you don't need the um, deeper aspect of the graft. And again, you're going to line up the limbal area with the limbal area of the patient from the graft to the recipient. I secure these down with casseal glue and then um, sutures anchoring on the corneal side just to be safe. Always feels like forever when you're watching your own videos. But. So I just anchor these down just out of um, an abundance of security in addition to the glue. And then I'm going to complete this in a 360 degree fashion covering the whole area. And then you'll see there's a small segment over here that will cut a piece to fit. Um, and place down as well. And then I use the seal to bring the conjunctiva up around the back side of each graft. And typically I'll cover the entire service with amniotic membrane at the end of the case. So the Cincinnati procedure combines um, these aspects. So you can use autologous um, limbal stem cells from the other eye, living related um, limbal stem cells, and then cadaver. Basically, the premise is you're adding some living cells that you can harvest some conjunctiva, and, but being able to give a 360 degree coverage with the addition of um, cadaver cells. So this is a patient with Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Um, and she unfortunately continued to slowly progress, had some blepharon um, and, and poor epithelium. So combined with plastics, we did some buccal mucosal grafting and fixed all of her fornices. And then I went back and did um, the Cincinnati procedure with donor tissue from her sister, um, and then filled in with cadaver tissue. And by month three, she did great. Um, she had a generally healthy cornea to begin with. She was back to 2060 and far more comfortable. Um, her main issue was just feeling very uncomfortable and poor surface. So she's done great. Um, and we're actually going to probably do her other eye relatively soon. This is a case of aniridia. Um, and so this patient was quite young. She's in her teens, but her limbal stem cell disease had started to progress. She, her functional vision had declined to count fingers. We did um, living related from her sister here. You can see it's usually a smoother, thinner graft and then the step up to the cadaver graft here. She's done great and has um, achieved her preoperative best corrective vision, which was 2300. And um, we just did her other eye, as a matter of fact, um, right before COVID hit. Um, this is probably the worst case that I've ever seen. This was a firecracker injury from a Roman candle. So this was how he looked when I first met him. He still had exposed cornea here. And so at this point, we were just trying to get him to heal without perforating. Um, by June, he had basically auto left his whole eye closed. So, and I apologize, I don't have better pictures. Um, a lot of these came from the family. So here he was unable to open his own eye. And at this point, he had a large reconstruction surgery done with myself and oculoplastics to reform his fornix. And I think a lot of this goes back to how important the fornix 
boxes and having good lid architecture because nothing is going to work if, if you don't have the right environment. This is how he looked relatively shortly after surgery. Um, amniotic membrane covering. And again, sorry, these are ice and photo families that I needed them. He was hand motion um, right after surgery and then did achieve a vision of about 2350. So you can see he did start to clear. We were able to see the iris. It was never perfect. Um, his post operative course was complicated. High, and so this prognosis is so pretty guarded, but much better, at least cosmetically, and with some functional vision than he had prior. Um, and ooh, sorry, this is, if I can get it to play, is a video of his surgery. So his, um, he got some cells. This is his brother, was a donor. And so obviously in cases like this, I try to take a lot of conjunctiva because that's going to serve the recipient well. Make sure I'm getting under the palisades of vote to get as many limbal stem cells as possible into clear cornea. And then we transfer this. Um, I label it the positioning. And then you can see here that a lot has improved as far as his lid architecture, but still very dry. Um, a lot of scarring. So we did our best to kind of loosen up the conjunctiva. We finally got everything freed up, and then we'll place that graph. And I think one thing to note um, when you're un undertaking these type of surgeries is when I pass my sutures, the cornea um, are very thin, thinner than you expect. So just be careful. It doesn't need to be full thickness. Um, you just need to secure it there in case anything moves or wiggles. That quick flash was me um, doing the lamellar of the cadaver graft to try to thin them out, anchoring them in position here, and then covering with amniotic membrane. Um, so that is the end of my talk. Hopefully it saved us some time um, and just showed you some of the clinical cases that can be greatly helped. The ones that will give you the challenges are obviously the more severe cases. Um, and hopefully I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Dr. Jellivoy? All right, it looks like we do have a question from Dr. Paro Deshpande. She said, why not combine oral mucosa MMG to reconstruct the surface? Um, well, in some cases we are using, using oral mucosa, especially if there are some blepharon or poor lid architecture. And usually I try to stage that um, to get the lid fornices and the area um, repaired first and then go back and do a limbal stem cell transplant. Um, up next, we have Dr. Albert Chung. Dr. Chung is a former fellow of Dr. Edward Holland at the renowned renown Cincinnati Eye Institute and is now assistant professor at the Eastern Virginia Medical School. He has more than 40 publications, 17 of which are on ocular surface disorders and or ocular surface stem cell transplantation, including the Cincinnati Protocol for preoperative screening and donor selection for ocular surface stem cell transplantation. He is a board member on the Holland Foundation for Site Restoration and on the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. He's on the Young Eye Surgeon Clinical Committee for 2020. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me. We'll be talking about immunosuppression and postoperative management with scattered multiple choice questions here. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Start off with the first question. So which ocular surface stem cell transplantation or OSST does not necessitate systemic immunosuppression? So A, living related conjunctival limbal allograph. B, keratolimbal limbal allograph. C, conjunctival limbal autograph. Or D, uh, allogenic clet or alloclet. C, Exactly. So I completely agree. 
Here we're using tissue from the contralateral eye, and so it's not foreign tissue, so don't need misoppression. So as we know, the stem, uh, limbal stem cells are located in palisades of oat, and there's increased risk of rejection uh, for allograft stem cell transplantation because of the limbal vasculature, as well as the increased number of longer Hans and antigen presenting cells. This can trigger immunologic rejection by T cells. And so we, we do need systemic immunosuppression for best results. And we'll treat these transplants similarly to vascular solid organ transplants instead of our more typical uh, avascular corneal transplants. So second question, which of the following is not a common um, OSST systemic immunosuppression regimen? So cyclosporin A and choice B, methotrexate. Choice C, uh, cyclosporin plus azathioprine or D, tacrolimus plus mycophenolate mofetil. You know, um, we'll go with B will be the answer. Um, methotrexate, you know, even though we use it commonly in other areas of ophthalmology, it's less commonly used for stem cell transplantation. Um, this slide goes over the more common systemic immunosuppression medications. There are two larger literature reviews looking at systemic immunosuppression listed here. Um, and they looked at uh, limbal stem cell transplantation and the associated medications. Um, they noted that there was a progression from earlier studies using cyclosporine A alone to the addition of azathioprine and mycophenolate um, as, as a adjunctive therapy. And then later studies um, moved on to combination therapy with uh, tacrolimus and mycophenolate. Most, um, most will use a course of high dose systemic corticosteroids as well. This is a Cincinnati Eye Institute and University of Cincinnati immunosuppression protocol. And this is what I use as well. It's important to note that uh, I do follow these patients with a organ transplant specialist. They're much more familiar with the medications and can help with a lot of nuances and making sure that uh, we follow these patients well. So before surgery, we'll start with immunosuppression after surgery. We'll titrate tacrolimus to about a level of eight to 10 for serum level. At six months, we can then lower that level to about five to eight. About a year, we can start tapering tacrolimus. And then at a few years out, we can start to discontinue, uh, we can consider discontinuing medications uh, if the patient is stable and no, no rejection. Some, some types, um, in some cases, we do need induction therapy. So this is for high risk eyes. So those with a high PRA value or repeat um, stem cell transplant patients. And so we'll start systemic immunosuppression earlier. But we'll also consider administering basileximab, uh, which is a monoclonal antibody uh, targeting T cells to, to prevent early immediate rejection. And so we'll administer that at the time of surgery as well as about four days post-operatively. So third question, what is true about PRA, a panel reactive antibody? A, it's a screening test for a range of known human leukocyte antigens. B, it can be elevated in patients with a history of exposure to non-self antigens. C, it's often used for donor selection and solid organ transplantation. Or D, all the above. Uh, will Dr. Manish Garg like to answer the question? Um, I'll give it a try, I mean. Uh, so it's hello. Can you hear me? Yep, can hear you. So what's true about the panel reactive antibody? Uh, screening test for ring. So these antigens uh, here. Uh, C is definitely there. A and B I think I, I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll give C a chance. So C, so C is definitely correct. Um, the other ones are also correct. So okay. it's excellent. Excellent way to work through that. So we'll go with D and we'll sort of talk a little, more, a little bit more about panel reactive antibodies since we use it in our perioperative management. And it's not really something that we use a lot in ophthalmology. So um, as we said, it's a screening test. You get a value of zero to 100 
and it gives you the percentage of the commun community that the recipient would likely react to based on preformed antibodies. We talked about it can be elevated um, based on a history of non self antigens. So, events such as a blood transfusion, pregnancy, or organ transplantation can, can elevate it. Um, the reason why it's important is because in the kidney literature, um, worse outcomes are associated with high PRA. We were going to present this at the World Coronary Congress, but this is um, data looking at ocular surface stability based on pre transplant PRA. And so, we divide our patients uh, based on PRA, so less than 80% and greater than equal to 80%. And then looked at aqua service failure and then as well as allograph rejection and found that our high, our high PRA group um, had a significantly higher rate of failure compared to low PRA group. Interestingly, rejection um, was not significantly different between the groups. Uh, this goes to one of the other questions earlier, like why would you check these? And, and because of the prognostic ability as well as the way we manage them, um, that can be a very important thing. So we'll treat them uh, more aggressively and, and be more, uh, more vigilant in treating them. Postoperatively, you also want to monitor certain labs. And so these are, these are a list of the labs that we checked about every three months and it includes the tacrolimus level. We'll also monitor blood pressure, cancer screening, and for other adverse events. We use anti, um, certain antimicrobials prophylactically. And so valgang cyclovir is used for CMV prophylaxis. Bactrim is used for PCP pneumonia prophylaxis. It's important for the ophthalmologist to understand that our stem cell patients are often healthier uh, than your typical um, solid organ transplant uh, patient. Also, we run our immunosuppression at lower rates than the, than the solid organ transplants do. So they typically, our patients will typically tolerate the systemic immunosuppression better than, uh, than other uh, solid organ transplant patients. This is a large study that looked at the adverse events in patients undergoing OSST. And there was a mean duration of immunosuppression of about three and a half years. Severe adverse events were minimal. Um, there were no deaths, no secondary tumors, no neurologic events. And there were only two patients that developed cardiovascular events. There was about 15% that developed minor adverse events that were often uh, well treated with medications or by just titrating the systemic immunosuppression. Immunosenescence is where the immune system becomes less reactive with age uh, and, the, and thus less prone to acute allograft rejection. And so this is data looking at our allograft patients um, that were 70 years and older. As you can see, we treat them with minimal systemic immunosuppression or no systemic immunosuppression. Uh, and still 54% overall were able to maintain a stable ocular surface at last follow-up. And the majority of eyes attain improvement in their visual acuity. And so in this group, uh, we can decrease systemic immunosuppression, but also try and improve their quality of life and their side effects from, from medications like, like we talked about. As we follow these patients postoperatively, we do want to look for complications such as rejection, glaucoma, infectious keratitis. So for our next question, what are the distinguishing features between severe and low-grade um, ocular surface transplantation rejection? So A, severity of pain and limbal injection. B, edema and neovascularization of, of the OSST segments. C, epithelial rejection line. Or D, signs of abnormal epithelium. Do we have Dr. Christine Shea on the line? Hey, Albert, if I remember correctly from your paper, I think the answer is A. Exactly. Love it. So question six, which of the following statements are true regarding glaucoma management with OSST? So ciliary sulcus tube placement may preserve the health of a pre-existent stem cell transplant. PCP or uh, cyclophotocoagulation uh, may be considered over a drainage device when there's conjunctival disease or deficiency. C, a substantial proportion of um, stem cell glaucoma eyes may require drainage and incisional surgery or D, all of the above. Okay, so Dr. Chung, let's ask Bhakti Dr. Bhakti, would you give us your best guess on this question? Uh, I think the answer would be D. Yes. D, all yes. of the above. Exactly. So completely agree. 
Uh, so the ciliary sulcus um, is going to be a little, you know, more posterior, and so it's a little further away from your stem cell transplant. And then uh, there's some data that uh, when there's conjunctival disease, it may be really tough to get a drainage device in there, and so we'll may consider CPC with, with with good results. The so rates of glaucoma and ocular hypertension can range from 23 to 47 percent. Um, Glaucoma may be from often as pre existent if there's a, a dependent on etiology or post transplant. A lot of times it's from a corticosteroid response. We want to manage these patients collaboratively with a glaucoma specialist, treat with anti glaucoma medications, uh, consider drainage devices or a diode a CPC a laser if we need to. Uh, next question What organism type is most associated with infectious keratitis following OSST? So A, fungus, B, gram-negative bacteria, C, gram-positive bacteria, or D, virus. Dr. Ai Chen, Dr. Ai Chen, will you try? Give us the best guess for this question. I think it's gram-negative bacteria. So gram uh, bacteria are, obvious, are, are most common, so I completely agree. Gram-positive seem to be a little more common, so it's just more of a technical thing. Um, so rates of infectious keratitis do range from zero to thirty percent. Um, we looked at a large we looked at a large cohort of eyes and found about a rate of nineteen percent. Bacteria were sixty uh, percent. So as you mentioned, so bacteria most common. Fungal, though less common, were still a third of third of the eyes. Um, Gram positive seem to be most common for bacteria in Canada, most common for uh, for fungal, and this is consistent with other um, the other larger cohorts in the literature. Risk factors for infectious keratitis um, include epithelial defects, a failed ocular surface, um, for fungus, um, chronic antibiotic use, and a cicatrizing etiology such as SJS, pemphigoid, severe chemical. Treatment, um, you wanna aggressively treat with antimicrobial agents, stop the uh, corticosteroids, at least temporarily, and have a low threshold for therapeutic keratoplasty, uh, especially if, if it's aggressive infection. So just a last slide, if there's stromal scarring, uh, we may need to treat with the keratoplasty for visual rehabilitation. Um, remember that keratoplasty alone in stem cell patients has a poor outcome, so treat the stem cell problem first. Studies have found improved outcomes with a, with a staged approach. Um, so we tend to wait at least three months after the stem cell transplant uh, before we're doing a keratoplasty. Deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, or DALK, um, has better outcomes, lower failure, compared to penetrating keratoplasty. And uh, like most of our outcomes, cicatrides and etiologies tend to have worse outcomes. So in conclusion, systemic immunosuppression is safe with proper monitoring and can help achieve long-term stability of the ocular surface. And managing complications is important to improve in long-term visual outcomes. So thank you so much for your attention and the invitation. Dr. Chung, thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. We're gonna go forward to our finale speaker and who else better than Dr. Virender Sangwan. He has over 550 presentations, over 245 publications to his name, a renowned international surgeon. He has made huge strides for all of us in the field of limbal stem cell transplantation as founder of the simple limbal epithelial transplantation procedure. He was the director of the Center for Ocular Regeneration and the Shrujona Center for Innovation at the LV Prasad Eye Institute and is currently director of innovations at Dr. Shroff's Charity Eye Hospital. Dr. Sangwan, thank you so much for being here. And we're gonna end this beautiful session with the road ahead. Thank you very much, Ashwina. And uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, educational activity. <clears throat> I'll share some of the ideas and uh, what I think the future holds and what we may be uh, using in, in the times to come. Also, we'll uh, start from what, how we started doing limbal stem cell in 2001 here in India. I have no commercial interest or technique or devices. 
this boy uh, presented to us uh, with this history of uh, accidental edible lime injury. Father brought him to remove the eye because the child was not going to the school and everybody was teasing him. So we offered him that instead of removing the eye, maybe we'll do a procedure which will, he will retain the eye and also see something from that eye. And this was the uh, before and this is the after. This is a simple limbal epithelial transplantation. And this is an outcome which is very gratifying to see in such a um, situation. Another very young four-year-old boy had a injury with a um, toilet cleaner, underwent amniotic membrane transplantation, and had a fulminant reaction uh, in, in the formation of granuloma, persistent epithelial defect formation. And from our experience of doing cultivated If we wait for a few months for the inflammation to settle and then do a cultivated limbal epithelial transplant or slat, it may not be a, a great idea. So this is the first patient we said, okay, we are going to do a slat in the autologous slat in the acute phase. And this is the outcome. The boy developed 2040, 2060 vision and with further amblyopia therapy and uh, correction, he improved uh, further. So how we started? Uh, essentially, uh, way back in 2000, uh, 2001, started growing the limbal stem cells using autologous serum of the patient. We never used 3T3 fibroblast or fetal calf serum. We would typically grow them as uh, for 10 to 14 days and uh, get a monolayer uh, and then transplant them after removing the penis. Initially, I used to use 10 monofilament sutures and then started using fibrin glue and published uh, or, uh, in, in a different journals, excellent you know, outcomes, which is uh, very gratifying with this procedure of cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation. This is one of my patients who happens to be from Delhi, and now uh, for her, I did a lim cultivated limbal epithelial transplant followed by a keratoplasty, and she has, uh, the follow-up is as recent as uh, two weeks, here in, in Delhi, and she's practically almost 20 year follow up now. So there's really not a much problem uh, in terms of the procedure, but what the issues are with the um, cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation is that it's an expensive procedure, only available in limited centers or can be available in limited centers uh, because of the expensive way of growing, maintaining the clean room. And then you have to obtain approvals. There is a potential for contamination or infection. And we observed, published in JAMA Ophthalmology in 2013, that 40% success rate in around 40 to 45% in pediatric LSAD. As that is happening. But what we, uh, when we started doing the simple limbal epithelial transplantation over a period of time, technique uh, which is widely available on, on, in the, on the published literature, so therefore I'll not spend much time on, on the technique part. I'll skip this video also. So this is the um, patient, another patient who is a pre-op and uh, six weeks post-op, uh, post slet this is a patient with one year uh, follow up before and after these are a uh, patient with two year follow up and this is a patient follow up now we have six seven year follow up and i'm sure uh, lv prasad my colleagues at lv prasad will be published of 125 eyes, uh, which has a mix of uh, adults and pediatric LSD patient. And the outcome of SLED are as good as in adults. Number two, the procedure in terms of outcomes, if the procedure is done by a senior surgeon or by a fellow or an intermediate surgeon, they are no different. Third, it's uh, clear that it's not very difficult to teach those who are interested and who wish to learn that procedure. And this is from that paper 
uh, immunohistochemistry of about 10 patients who underwent PK following uh, SLAD. Then there is a you know publication uh, in BJO 2016 of an uh, international group uh, who published collated their data and they uh, of uh, SLAT and they uh, discovered exactly the same what we reported. Then uh, paper from Dr. Amasqua from Bascom Palmer showed that there is a technique which can be done as a sandwich technique. He used double lay layer of the amniotic membrane to make sure that the explant doesn't fall and uh, the outcomes were reported in AJO again and you can see these some of the pictures from the same paper. Uh, this is the double sandwich technique. So it works equally well. Then we started doing uh, this uh, mini slat or uh, patients uh, with the pterygium uh, where ipsilateral slat, we take a SNP biopsy from the same eye excise the, uh, the abnormal tissue, and then you put uh, five, with fibrin glue, you can put few uh, explants. And I've been doing this procedure since then with reasonably good outcome. Then there, there is a paper which was published from Mexico um, by uh, our uh, colleagues and friends from uh, Mexico, of, and they named it mini slat for pterygium surgery. Then there have been a couple of papers which I'm not uh, put up here, but uh, Alan Slomovich from Toronto has published for recurrent pterygium or recurrent pterygium and effective um, management with this slab. These are some of the pictures from the paper from Max BJO. Then there we made in 2007, 2008, 2007 and 2008 that in limbal biopsies which we are growing in the lab, there are some mesenchymal cells. And we uh, published two papers, in, one in molecular vision and another in IOVS, characterizing these cells and then comparing it, the gene expression analysis with the epithelial cells. But what we did not understand their significance at that time, what they are doing, how they are helping. Several years later, we realized that, that they have uh, some significant role to play. We uh, started thinking, can we use mesenchymal stem cells, cultivated mesenchymal stem cells, to treat the superficial scars without doing a laser? So to pursue this idea, one of my uh, fellow uh, who, was, who joined as a faculty, Dr. Sian Basu, uh, went to Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, with the, uh, and, and learning the technique of growing the mesenchymal cells. And, then doing the experiment in the, my, in, the, in the rat. And he published an excellent paper showing that it really works well. So we designed a therapy uh, with autologous limbal dried mesenchymal therapy. Um, and what we will do is we grow the cells in the, in the lab and then mix them with the, in the fibrin glue and remove the epithelium, put the uh, fibrin glue mixed with the mesenchymal cells and then put a bandage contact lens. So what we uh, did this uh, in collaboration with Professor Fundenberg, who was really a pioneer in, um, in stem cell uh, for the coronal stroma. Some of these results were presented in the RO, and we could find that there is a improvement, as you can observe here, the change in the scar density when you use gel with the cells. Similarly, a, an uncorrected uh, logma uh, equity improvement. So we started thinking, yes, if there is a definite some improvement, and there was some paper, especially from a group at Harvard Medical School, from Sunil Chauhan's lab, that uh, they worked uh, out the mesenchymal, mesenchymal, uh, mesenchymal stem cells for corneal regeneration in a mice model. And then we started thinking that, you know, autologous is not a viable option. We, we thought that maybe allogenic cooled allogenic limbal uh, mesenchymal stem cell would be a better option. So how do we come to that uh, uh, sort of conclusion is, one of our patients who underwent SLAT in two, August of 2011, it looked like this, and you see he did not want a corneal transplant or a DAL, and he said, I'm happy. So he used to come every year, and we observed that every year there is a further improvement in the corneal clarity, 
and uh, the transparency and the vision improves. And he reached finally after five years, uh, 2040. How did that happen? My postulation is that there is some role mesenchymal cells played because the explant here in the, in the slat, they, are, they become integrated uh, in the coronal epithelium and they act as a uh, sort of a mini limbus for, for many years to come as opposed to clad where you do not see the um, explants after the initial few weeks. So, and from this, we uh, sort of uh, can that it's worthwhile pursuing the mesenchymal therapy. And now we are using mesenchymal therapy under protocols for variety of different diseases in ophthalmology. Also, uh, I have been working on um, biosynthetic cornea and the liquid cornea um, development for several years now. And I think uh, in future, we should be able to combine simple limbal epithelial transplantation with And if needed, uh, you can do SLED. Then uh, one of my colleagues uh, at LVP, uh, who's an ocular oncologist, I taught her to do the uh, primary slat in patients with large OSSN uh, in, in, uh, at the time of oxygen. So if you have like such situation like in this patient case one, uh, less than two to three clock hours, you really don't need any additional surgery. But if you have um, bigger uh, three clock hours, then you, it, with the oxygen and amniotic membrane, you will sim, uh, develop the uh, limbal stem cell deficiency, which is more difficult to treat. In those cases, we started combining uh, primary slat, and the, that paper was published in AJO, I think 2017 or 2018, with an excellent outcome. And this is one of our case, uh, Dr. Swati Kalki. You see large uh, placoid lesion, uh, primary excision with uh, standard protocol of OSS and extrusion followed with a primary um, slat from the limbal biopsy from the same eye, another area. And outcome was very good. This is another case and so I'll just skip. So what I think there are many ideas that I'm currently working with the um, few collaborators, like it's possible now cell farming using the limbus dried mesenchymal cells. So what we mean by this is, I've been working with Professor May Griffith uh, from Sweden and Canada of you know, recombinant collagen, which is dried from, from different sources. What I, we think now is that mesenchymal cells dried from the limbus can be used to make the collagen, which from which we can make liquid cornea or biosynthetic cornea or both. It's possible. We have done uh, pilot studies of combining mesenchymal cells with liquid cornea. Uh, then Sunil Singh's group uh, from Harvard have uh, written and shown that hepatocyte growth factor, which is dried from the mesenchymal cells, could can restore the transparency. Therefore, someday we may have only eye drops, no need of mesenchymal cells to uh, treat the limbal stem cell deficiency or injuries. Similarly, um, I have been ex experimenting with the ideas and now there are studies going in LVP and with me here in, in Delhi that cultivated mesenchymal cells can be used for allergic eye disease, they can be used for Moran's ulcer, they can be used for treatment of uveitis, the treatment with, for uveitis is experimental in, in vitro in the lab, you no know, human trials. So in summary, uh, the SLAT and its modifications are effective in treating limbal stem cell deficiency, uh, OSSN, and the technique is being modified. And today I learned several new terms uh, like SOMAT. Um, there is a conjectival uh, SLAT. Uh, there's somebody doing a similar kind of surgery for the skin. So replication of SLED is globally very heartening to see. And pediatric limbal stem cell deficiency SLED seems to be excellent. And uh, from the limbal biopsy, we are able to harvest the mesenchymal, uh, mesenchymal cells, which eventually can serve uh, us in many different ways. Thank you very much. Dr. Sangwan, thank you so much for that. I mean, that just gives you chills to see what the road ahead looks like. And the biosynthetic cornea, I think all of us are just going to be watching and waiting for, for your transformation on that 
So looking forward to that. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Sangon? I had a quick uh, question just regarding technique. Um, great presentation. Um, when you're doing SLET, and are you are you currently doing a sandwich with the amniotic membrane? No, no, Albert. I don't do sandwich. You okay. know the reason for, the reason for the sandwich was that uh, I'm gonna lose it. No, yes, there was a fear, uh, <laughs> and he was just starting. Um, um, okay. He was just starting, and some of his seniors said, "You know, uh, it may not be safe just using the amniotic membrane and bandage contact lens." Then he called me. He said, "Can I use a sandwich technique?" I said, "I haven't used, but try." So it worked out well. And then he did five, six cases. I said, "Then encourage him to write up." Very good. Excellent. Anyone else? Well, I want to thank everyone for being here today. I mean, it was such a fantastic lineup. Um, I learned a ton. I hope all of you did too. A special thanks to Pragrathi Chowdhury, who's worked behind the scenes. She's my intern from Cornell. Um, and she's put in a lot of work into this, into making sure that everyone's audio, visuals, um, registrations, everything goes well. So, so thank you to Pragrathi. What would, where would we be without our faculty? Our faculty has um, taken their time from all over different parts of the world at this time to be with us. Thank you so much. And for all of our participants, thank you for joining us time and time again. July 19th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, iBanking and COVID-19 will be a very important topic. So stay tuned to that. And I look forward to meeting each one of you in the near future without a mask, post-COVID, healthy, happy, and well. So thank you.